Hi guys, uh, Pastor Greg Corcoran here from Battlefield Baptist Church. Uh, pray that this sermon is a blessing and encouragement and a challenge to you in your walk with the Lord. Additionally, I just wanted to say that if we here at Battlefield can ever be a blessing to you, please don't hesitate to contact us. And the best way to do that is through our website at battlefieldbaptist.org. Again, I pray this sermon blesses you, encourages you, and uh, that you'll fall more in love with God, more in love with his word, and more in love with people. If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, while you're finding your place and ones <clears throat> are making their way down. A few items of housekeeping. First, I see him trying to sneak off over on the side over there, indiscreet. We would be remiss if we did not welcome our missionaries sent out of Battlefield Baptist Church to Wales. Dave and Mary Campbell. Would you guys just stand up real quick? Just... Praise God. Thank you, thank you so much for all that you're doing for the Lord over there in Wales. Um, Dave, if you'd come, open up the word for... No, I'm just playing. Uh, he's, he's like, oh. Uh, also, um, I have a note up here. Thank you for this note, whoever sent this note, because we can celebrate this all day. Um, Tolly and Debbie Wyant are celebrating 52 years of marriage today. Yeah. Yeah, praise God. Praise God for that. Um, additionally, I would ask you to please be in prayer. Uh, please be in prayer for Monica Clark. You might know Monica and Rick Clark. Her mom went home to be with the Lord earlier this week um, in South Korea. And so if you could just please be in prayer for her. Continue to be in prayer as well for Miss Ann as she's still in Fairfax recovering from her surgery as well. If you do something, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Again, we'll be in Hebrews chapter 11. Really, for our message this morning, we'll be in verses 1 through 3, but I, I kind of want to read through the first six verses. It says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh unto God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Pray with me. God, thank you so much for your word. Your word promises us, us that through your spirit, and he would help to guide us in the truth. So this morning, Father, we ask that you would do this, just that. Guide us in your truth and your word this morning. Help us to rightly divide it. Father, help us to apply it to our lives. Give us the courage then to adjust our lives according to your word and not vice versa. Be honored in all that's said and done here. We pray this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> This morning, we're going to start a brand new series on faith, which we've aptly entitled, Faith. <laughs> and since this is week one, I've aptly entitled my message, number one. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I understand. So in my studies this week, I, um, I ran across a short story that I thought maybe would help us get the ball rolling this morning. It hit home a little bit to me, maybe it will to you. It says, a man fell off a cliff, but he managed to grab a tree limb on the way down. And the following conversation ensued. 
He says, is there anybody up there? He said, I am down here. I am here. I, I am the Lord. Do you believe me? He said, yes, Lord, I believe. I really believe, but I can't hang on much longer. That's all right. If you really believe, you have nothing to worry about. Just let go, and I will save you. Then there was a pause. Is there anybody else up there? <laughs> right, some days I think that this really does encapsulate our level, at least mine, uh, of faith pretty well. And so my question is, like, what do, you, what do you think of when you hear the word faith? In fact, if I were to ask you this morning to describe faith to someone who's never even heard, heard really of the word faith or, or the concept of religion, how would you describe faith? Maybe you think of a specific, a specific belief system like the Muslim faith or the Catholic faith. People talk about keeping the faith or losing the faith. There's faith in God, there's faith in family, faith in the economy. I've even heard tale, now being from where I'm from, I've not ever witnessed this with my own two eyes, but I've heard tale of even having faith in your football team. <laughs> but since the term can be used in many different ways, I do think that it's important for us to really clarify what it is that we mean when we say faith. And so your, our first point for this morning, which you can actually find in your brand new Battlefield Trifold, which it does have some sermon notes in it. I've also put some, uh, some helpful vocabulary words that you're going to notice through this message in it. So if you didn't get one, the next time you walk through these doors, you should grab one. It might have some useful tidbits in it. But this is your first point and our first fill in through those notes. It's, it's the meaning of faith, right? Let's take a second and describe what do we mean by faith. When the New Testament authors write of faith in God, they use the Greek word pistis, pistis, and it means firm persuasion. The related word pistos, it means faithful. And as it is in English, it can be either a noun, right, meaning as in the faithful, right, referring to believers, or it can be used as an adjective, as in the good and faithful servant. The Hebrew word for faith is imunah, and it means steadfastness, faithful, trustworthy. It describes more than just believing a statement about God. And here's this next part. I boldened it. I highlighted it. I underlined it in my notes. Maybe you could write it down. I liked it. It says, it is faith that results in faithfulness. Right? And it implies action. Imunah has a root in the Hebrew word iman, meaning to confirm. Both share the root in the Hebrew word amen, which means so be it, or truth. Thus, when we say amen at the end of a prayer, we are in part, in essence, agreeing to act upon what we have just prayed. Yeah. And thus, faith doesn't just happen in your head. Right? We see in James 2.17, James wrote, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. One commentator, he paraphrased James 2.17 by saying, Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? Right? True faith implies action. True biblical faith isn't blind optimism or some manufactured hope so feeling. Neither is true faith an intellectual assent into some doctrine that we learned. And, and it is certainly not believing in spite of the evidence. That's nothing short of superstition. Rather, true biblical faith is confident obedience in God's word in spite of the circumstances and consequences. Let that soak into your heart for a moment this morning. True faith is confident obedience in God's word in spite of the circumstances and consequences. Right in our passage this morning, it's the only time that, that really uh, in the Bible that defines faith. In fact, I would even consider it as more of a description of faith. Look at Hebrews 11, verse 1. It says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of of things not seen. And so we find two words here in Hebrews 11, verse 1, that help summarize true biblical faith for us. 
right? And in our quest to describe and define what faith really is this morning, I hope that you can find them useful, right? The first, we have translated substance. It comes from the word hypostasis, right? And it literally means sitting under to support assurance or title deed, right? In other words, faith is to the Christian what a foundation is to a house, Right? It gives us confidence and assurance that he will stand no matter the circumstance, regardless of the consequence. So you might say that faith is the consequence or the confidence of things hoped for. So when a believer has faith, confidence and assurance, that is what is promised will be experienced. Right? The substance is the title deed, giving him ownership of what God has promised. Then we find the word evidence, right? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That word evidence is a lenkos, and it means conviction, right? This is the inward conviction that what God has promised, he will perform. So according to most commentators, this is what is meant um, by these two words, substance and evidence. Therefore, what could or, or would be defined as faith could go something like this. The assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not yet seen. Matthew Henry, that great servant of yesteryear, he wrote this. It, referring to faith, is a firm persuasion and expectation that God will perform all that he has promised to us in Christ. And this persuasion is so strong that it gives the soul possession of those things, right? Faith is described as an act of the mind and an act of the heart, right? And, and it, right, in our heart and in our mind, right, we believe something that, and we have the assurance and then the conviction that it's true. And while it certainly is true, right, Scripture also seems to suggest that faith is an actual possession of reality, right? After all, isn't that what hypostasis means, right? Substance, hypostasis, title deed, isn't that what it suggests? The person who holds the title deed is actually in possession of that property. He has it already. Certainly, this seems to be the case from God's perspective. When you consider um, we already possess his promises, he's already seated us with the heavenlies, and already we possess eternal life. That's what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, verse 5. It says, even when we were dead in sins, he hath quickened us together with Christ. By his grace we are saved and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places. In Christ Jesus. And so my point is this. Holding the title deed of the property, possessing something, is more than just assurance and conviction. It is possessing reality. Right? Actually holding something that is substantial and real. Faith is possessing the substance of the promises of God. Right? So in that sense, it is both an act of the mind of the heart and it is also a possession of something that we believe, right? It's believing and trusting in that which actually exists and in that which we can actually possess. We may not be able to, to see it, but it is real. It is existing. We can possess it by believing it and having faith in it. And that's to say we can possess it now. We cannot see it right now, but we can actually possess the very substance of it by believing and entrusting our lives with it, right? The substance and evidence in the very fact that I already possess eternal life, right? And this is the basis and conviction of never tasting or experiencing death, right? So the writer of Hebrews makes it very clear that faith is actually a very practical thing. Right? It's very practical. In spite of what unbelievers say, it's faith that enables us to understand what God did and what he also is doing and is yet to do. Faith enables us to see what unbelievers cannot see. As a result, faith enables us to do what unbelievers cannot do. It was Dr. J. Oswald Sanders. He said this, faith enables the believing soul to treat the future as present and the invisible as seen. Right? So that's just a little look at what we mean by faith, the meaning of faith. I want to take a look now at the reward of faith. 
Verse 2, Hebrews 11, verse 2, right? What is the reward of our faith? Well, the reward of our faith is God's approval, right? God is pleased, in fact, very pleased when we have faith. When we believe him, when we believe in his promises, it tells us that God is pleased. Hebrews 11, verse 2, for by it, faith, the elders obtained a good report. So that phrase that we have in the King James there that says, obtained a good report, it actually comes from one word, martyreo, and it means to be a witness, charge, right, to give evidence, bear record, give testimony. It actually appears several times throughout the chapter. We find it in verse 2, verse 4, verse 5, and 39. And then in the summary of what verse, uh, chapter 11 is stating, ver, uh, chapter 12, verse 1, calls this list of men and women so great a cloud of witnesses, martyreo, right? And these elders, these, these great men of God who lived in the past, they believed God, they followed God, they turned away from the world and its possessions, its pleasures, and they followed God. They believed that God had much more to offer, in fact. They believed his promises of eternal life and land were true. And because they believed that his promises were true, because they had that conviction, therefore they staked their lives on it. And in that, they were able, or they had uh, um, that hope that faith, and it says that that faith pleased God, right, through their action. Therefore, God accepted their faith, and he honored them because of it. Matthew Henry, he wrote this, believers in the exercise of faith are filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Christ dwells in the soul by faith, and the soul is filled with the fullness of God. And so one of the ways that God has honored them is by recording their faith in his word and then by um, using their faith as an example to challenge believers through all the generations, right? Um, and, and so, yes, we see this in the latter part of Hebrews 11, which God willing, Lord willing, will we'll get into maybe through this series, right? We call it the hall of faith. But this honor isn't just for the saints in the Old Testament, Right? In fact, in Paul's day, he actually says that people from all over the world talked about the faith of the church in Rome. We see Romans 1.8. First, I thank um, my God through Jesus Christ for all of you that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Man, what a testimony. Would to God that people from all over the world would talk about the faith of people in Battlefield Baptist Church. Right? But God's also fulfilled their faith and honored them by taking them home with him. Right? So the reward of our faith is God's approval. When God approves us, he accepts us then into his eternal presence. This means that God looks after us. He's given us victory over all the enemies of this world, including death. And he does it for eternity. That's why Jesus speaks of this victory over death in John uh, chapter 3, verse 14. He was telling Nicodemus, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He goes on to say in chapter 5, verse 24, Truly, or verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and he shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. And so the approval of God means that God fulfills his promises then to us. Right? And that the promises of God become a living reality in our experiences, both daily and forever through eternity. Right? So that is the reward of our faith. Now our third point is the basic understanding of our faith. Look at verse 3. Hebrews 11, verse 3. It says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. Right? Faith enables us to look out into creation right, and understand that there is no way 
that the beautiful things of this earth, it, it enables you to look out on a sunrise or a sunset and see its beauty and understand there is no way that that was made by anything that I have ever seen. Man has been fallen since the beginning, since Genesis chapter 3, and the earth has been cursed ever since. There is no way that fallen man or a cursed earth has produced something so beautiful. Right, And that's what creation allows us to do, is to look out and understand that God exists. God created the world. This is the Christian believer's starting point. Right, This is square one. It's, it's more than just an assumption. To understand here means to perceive it with the mind, to know a true fact. And we can base this understanding right, that God created the world on a few things. The first is on the world itself. Right? When we look out, when we study it, we think about its origin, its, its purpose, and even its end. Right? David put it this way in Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Right? Paul put it this way in Romans 1.19. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. How? For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world. Right? Our understanding of it as intelligent designer is also based on the Bible itself. It's clearly written right, in the Word of God, the, the written revelation of God. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created what? The heaven and the earth. Right? We also see this understanding of an intelligent designer is also based on the witness of the Holy Spirit. Right? It's given to every single believer. He bears witness that Jesus Christ right, and, and, the, and the Word of God are true. Right? So when a person believes, when they place their faith in Jesus Christ, his spirit then dwells inside of the heart of the believer, and the Holy Spirit seals, it guarantees, it bears witness that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and the promises of his teachings that we find throughout the Word of God are true. And so my whole point is this, that the believer has strong sources to show that the origin and purpose of the, the, the end and the beginning of all things, and these sources are undeniable. Why are they undeniable? Because I can look out and see the world. I can see creation. You can't tell me that creation doesn't exist. It's undeniable. It exists. And the world says it's telling me and it's telling you that there is an intelligent designer, a creator that made it. It's also undeniable because we can look at and observe the Bible. Yes, I can look at and observe a physical copy of the Bible, but I can also look at its teachings and promises. I, I can look at the, the teachings and promises of the Word of God at work in people's lives of those who believe it, right? The Word of God is true, and, and it's absolutely true that we can see it working in believers' lives just as it claims. Right? And the Bible says that God made the world. So again, this is another undeniable source. And we can also know right through the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's undeniable because we can look at believers and see the evidence of him working in their lives. Right? We may not be able to see him, the Holy Spirit, as it were. But I can see his work, the fruit of the Spirit, as it were, at work in your life. Because it bears witness to the believer's heart that the claims and promises of the word of God are true. And so all of these things are strong, undeniable witnesses that bear record of God's existence and that he has created the world. And so just kind of to, to kind of begin that, like wrap up our time here this morning. I know it's quick, fast, man. You guys ought to be excited. All right. <laughs> all right. Listen, we're not closing. Don't get too excited. But we're, we're heading on the down slope, right? The praise team doesn't need to come, but they ought to be ready, you know? Uh, it, I just want to take a look at an example of faith, right? So we've kind of looked at the, the meaning of faith and then the reward of faith. And then we have this basic kind of understanding of faith from Hebrews 1, 2, and 3. Now, I want to look outside of that passage for an example of what that passage is talking about. And so we find um, our example in Matthew chapter 9. Turn there with me. Again, I think all that stuff we just discussed is very important as it helps set the foundation for this entire series 
on faith. So it may have been a little more technical than you would have liked to hear in terms of all the vocabulary, which again is written in your battlefield trifold for you to study and take home. <laughs> but I think it will be helpful for us in the future, right? This has been a good foundation for this um, series, as it were. And so the example of faith, we find it in Matthew chapter 9, verse 27. It says this, when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came unto him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were open, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But when they were departed, they spread abroad his fame in all of the country. Yeah. Hey, blindness was a problem in the East in Jesus' day, right? The records actually indicate that Jesus healed at least six blind men. And in every instance, it was a little bit different, right? But this cry from help, it came from two blind men. And in the context of the entire chapter, chapter right, we find out that it's probable that these two men were sitting by the roadside probably begging because in Jesus' day, most blind men were beggars. And these two heard what was happening. A cord is struck in their heart and they begin to follow Jesus, crying out, thou son of David, have mercy on us. Right? These two men were blind. I hate to point out the obvious, but that means that they cannot see. Right? They could not see what Jesus was doing. They could only hear. Right? Blindness throughout the scriptures is often this picture of, of spiritual ignorance and unbelief. We see this principle. It's revealed in the Old Testament. It's not just a New Testament principle. We find it in the Old Testament, in Isaiah 6.10. It says this, make the heart of the people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and they hear with their ears and they understand with their heart and convert and be healed. We also see it in the New Testament when Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees and he tells his disciples, he says, listen, let them alone, right? They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, they're both going to fall into a ditch, right? The lost are blind. They, they cannot see, right? They cannot understand. The, the lost can only hear. But listen, praise God, because Romans 10, 17 says, so that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The hearing of God and his great love for us through the revelation of God in the flesh, right? That is Jesus Christ is all that we need. I'll just give you a little side note. Dude, just please take it, take it with the, the heart that I intend it. Be careful always looking for some sign or basing your faith on some sign. Right? These things don't produce real faith in Jesus Christ. Right? These guys couldn't even see the miracles that Jesus had just performed. Right? They couldn't see right, the, 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 ruler's, uh, um, the, the ruler's daughter that had been risen from the dead earlier in Matthew 9. Right? They couldn't see the woman who was healed after bleeding for 12 years. Right? They didn't see either the dead body or the resurrected body. They couldn't see the woman. They couldn't see her bleeding. They couldn't see her touch the hem of his garment and then be healed and stop bleeding. They couldn't see any of that. All they could do was just hear what was happening. Right? Listen, you may not have ever been able to, to, to see or have seen the supernatural, but that's okay. Because faith doesn't come by seeing, right? Faith comes by hearing. Hearing the gospel is the only hope for the lost. That's why it's imperative. It is imperative that we continue to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost and dying world. Anyways, off that soapbox, Matthew 9, verse 28. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came unto him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Yes. Yes, we believe. Listen, God, God, is, God is perfect. That's just who God is. Right? And in his, his perfection, it's, it's not just limited to one of his attributes. Right? It, it's defining of all of his attributes because that's just who he is. So, so when it says God is love, right, um, that, that means it is perfect love. 
right? He is, he is perfect love. When it, it says that God is just, that, that means his justice, it is also perfect. So when it's God is righteous, his righteousness is also perfect, and so on and so on and so on with every attribute of God. But listen to what Charles Simeon wrote. He says, but there seems to be a propriety regarding his power as the more immediate object of our faith. Because it will be of no purpose to believe him well disposed towards us if we do not also believe him able to affect his gracious intentions. Listen, the most renowned instances of our faith, the power of God has been chiefly regarded. Consider Abraham, whose faith was often so highly commended. He had respect to the power of God. It was going to give him a son when both he and his wife were well beyond the childbearing years. And he responded with this confident obedience in God's word, right? Yes, I will leave my family. I will leave my land. In spite of the circumstances and the consequences, he had faith. Right, And when he's asked to offer up his son, he believed that God had the power then to raise him from the dead in order to fulfill what God had promised. In dependence on the power of God, Jonathan attacked the Philistine garrison. Jehoshaphat went forth against three allied armies, and the Hebrew youth withstood the command of the Babylonian monarch. And also, in the most remarkable instances of unbelief, his power is also primarily doubted. Consider Sarah. She questioned the power of God to give her a child. Right? The Israelites questioned the power of God to give them bread. Martha deemed the rotting state of her brother's corpse to be this insurmountable bar to the resurrection of his life. And at the heart of Jesus' question to these two blind men is a question regarding their belief in his power. It's not simply, do you believe that I am a guy named Jesus? Right? James tells us, so what? So what? The devils also believe, and yet they tremble. It's, do you believe that I have the power to do this? And they responded, yes, Lord. Hey, our faith is only as strong as the object in which it's placed. Right? We find all throughout the scriptures, it's not necessary to have great faith. Even small faith is enough as long as it is in a great God. Church, we serve a great and mighty God. And so listen, with all of this in mind, we see that faith operates quite simply. Maybe it's an oversimplification, simplification in your mind. God speaks and we hear his word. We trust in his word. And then we act on it, no matter what the consequences may be. Right? The circumstances may be impossible. The the consequences may be frightening to us and they may be unknown. But we obey God's word just the same. And we believe him to do what is right and what is best. Right? The unsaved world doesn't understand biblical faith, perhaps because it sees very little of it in action from the church today. The word faith, from the world's perspective, maybe as one cynic cynic defined it, a logical belief in the occurrence of the impossible. And that's because what the world often fails to realize is that faith is only as good as the object in which it is placed. And the object of our faith is God. Therefore, faith is not a feeling that we manufacture, It is our total response to what God has revealed in his word. And so I just want to leave you with one of the great verses of scripture, right? Uh, Put it, again, at the bottom of your battlefield tripod. (laughs) Maybe one that should be memorized and meditated on by in the heart of every believer. So here it is, Hebrews 11, verse 6. It says, but without faith, It is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. It is impossible to please God without faith. 
It is impossible to please God without a living, active faith, a faith that knows God, a faith that believes God, a faith that fellowships with God. The writer says that it's utterly impossible to please God without faith. What does this mean? The person without faith will never be acceptable or accepted by God. And that may sound like a harsh reality, but that's the word of God. Without faith, a person will never live with God in this world or in the next. Without faith, a person will have to plow through this life alone and handle all of its trials, its temptations, its sufferings, its accidents, its diseases and death by his or herself. Without faith, it is impossible to please him at all. Jesus said in John 3, verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. John the Baptist, he went on to say in verse 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Chapter 8, verse 24, I said therefore unto you, this is Jesus, that ye shall die in your sins. For if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. So a person who comes to God must believe two things. Must believe that he is God. Right? That is that God exists. He must believe that God is a rewarder or he rewards those that diligently seek him. Right? God doesn't reward the sleepy-eyed or the complacent, the, the worldly-minded, the half-hearted, the half-interested pleasure-seeker, but those who diligently seek after him. The reward of our faith is to be approved by God, and when God approves us, he then accepts us into his eternal presence. But without faith, we will never be accepted into his presence. That's just the word of God. Do you have faith in God this morning? Right? Do you have faith in God this morning? The Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right? And there's a wage for that sin. And it it goes on to describe the wage for that sin. It says that the wages of sin is death. Actually, the second death, to be exact. And it's referring to an eternity separated from God in a place that the Bible calls hell. But praise God, because the rest of the passage says that eternal life, right, is the gift of God. Right? Right? It's the gift that he gives us. How? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Bible describes that God loves us so much he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him won't perish, but they can have everlasting life. Whoever places their faith in him can be accepted of God and be rewarded to live in his presence, right? Eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. God came to this earth in the form of his only son, Jesus. He lived a perfect and sinless life, right? That made him the only worthy sacrifice for your sin and for my sin as well, right? He died on the cross. He was buried. We know it wasn't a hoax. And then he rose again on the third day, conquering death, conquering hell, conquering what we rightly deserve for our sin. And then he rose again on the third day, right? Belief is a prerequisite to faith. Belief alone is not enough, right? Again, James tells us that the devils believe. Well, so what? Right? Our belief in Christ must drive us to action. That is faith. That is faith. And so if you've never called out upon the name of the Lord, that's your next action. To take that belief, yes, I believe that there was a man named Jesus, right, that he was the very son of God and that he died for my sins. And then put that into action by calling upon the name of the Lord. And the Bible says that when you do that, thou shall be saved. Would you stand with me as we're getting ready to enter into just a moment of invitation? Here in just a second, I'm going to pray, and when I pray, this altar will be open. If you need to come and call upon the name of the Lord so that you can be saved, you come. 
you come. If you need to come and pray, whatever it may be, we have tons of needs in here, tons of people hurting. Hey, the altar is open. It's not a place of embarrassment, as Pastor Greg would always say. It's a place of acknowledgement, a place that we can come and acknowledge our need, that we are needy people before a righteous, mighty God. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for this opportunity to have been in your house. Thank you so much for for the revelation that you've given us of yourself and of your son through your word. God, I pray that you would work and move during this moment of invitation as only you can. I pray that if there's someone here, God, who's never placed their faith in you, their belief in you has never resulted in an action in them surrendering their life to you. They've never called out upon you. God, I pray that they would do that right now. God, maybe they're sitting in their seat and they could even pray a prayer simply just saying, Jesus Christ, I I, I." Forgive me of my sin. I am a sinner. God, come into my life. Save me this morning. God, I pray that they would run to you, repent from their sin and run to you. God, work and move through this moment of invitation in a way that only you can. We'll be sure to give you all the glory from. Amen.